It is my pleasure to greet you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as we continue our study of God's Word in order to gain the strength that we need for this time and in order to hear the voice of God for our life circumstances and in order to be encouraged in our spirits uh, that God is with us and the Lord is able. And so I invite you uh, here at First Baptist Church 101 South Wilmington Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, you may reach the church at 919-832-1649. You can go to our website as well, and you can go to our Facebook, and you can catch us on YouTube. But we invite you to study the Word with us and get your Bible so you can follow along as we read the Word together. And uh, our mission is to be a point of contact for the kingdom of God. And we are praying that we would experience a unity and the power of, of the kingdom of God and be able to express that in the way that we live and the way that we serve. And we know that we have help in order to do that. That doesn't come naturally, but it comes from the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And Acts 1.8 tells us that we have received power through the Holy Spirit that we might be a witness for what God has done, for what God is doing, and for what God will do in days ahead. And so we believe in a life of prayer and intercession, and so we pray for the world in which we live. We pray, we're pray. we praying for our nation, and we're praying for our state, our city, and we're certainly praying for our church, but also every church that is open in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, as we come together, we know that God is able, by the Holy Spirit, to give us uh, a double portion. And so that's our theme for this year, along with seeking spiritual blessings. And part of those spiritual blessings and significant to those uh, are our times in reading the Word of God. And so I invite you to join me with uh, reading the Word from 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but all the way toward the end of the Bible, 1 John. And uh, we're reading chapter 1, and we enter into chapter 2 uh, for this lesson today. So come along with me as we read the Word. We're going to read the first chapter, and then we're going to begin uh, today and for today's study at verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. For it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lord bless his word to our hearts and encourage our spirits as we apply that word to our living. Uh, if you remember uh, from last time as we are moving through uh, this epistle, this letter, 1 John, that we are identifying guiding principles to help us uh, make this portion of scripture real to us and not just read it just to be reading it, but also we're looking for an experience with God, an experience that we can share with others. And our guiding principles are hearing the word to make sure that we hear the story that is being told. And that story is the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we are sharing that story with others around us once we understand the story and the story becomes ours. And then as a result, we're asking God to help us to live out that story. It's more than just attending church or going to a religious ritual uh, process, but really it's about uh, giving our hearts to God and living that out in terms of our lives. And uh, God then empowers us to do that. And, and the question that I really want uh, you to wrestle with today from the questions, the previous questions we have raised is, what difference has Jesus Christ made in your life? And uh, we will discuss that along with these particular truths and nuggets that we receive 
from this epistle of 1 John. And we learned from last time, and that is verses uh, uh, 1, 5 through 7, that, that God is light, uh, meaning that God does not support uh, darkness or evil, uh, but God is righteous and God is good, and that God uh, represents the light like daylight, and God comes into our hearts to bring light and to show every aspect of what is true and what is real. And then also uh, we are invited to, to, to live in the light, and that light is Jesus Christ, but we're invited to live in that uh, so that we can take authority over areas in our lives uh, that are opposite what God has called us to be about or what God has called us to do. And then we understand that, that there's fellowship in the light and that we're not alone in this, but there are other believers along with us. And isn't that beautiful to know that you're part of a family, a spiritual family, you're part of a larger fellowship. And uh, it's not just you on this journey, but there are millions upon millions of people who are on the same journey because they too want to live in the light that God has provided through Jesus Christ who said, I am the light of the world. And because of that, then we can have fellowship with others. And in that fellowship, we are made better. Uh, we are ma maturing in that fellowship, but also we have access to the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. And so we are cleansed through the blood, uh, not through our ethical behavior, but rather through the blood of the Lamb. And that brings uh, to fore, and that brings uh, center stage and the cross of Jesus Christ and what that cross means. And Jesus was crucified and he died on an old rugged cross for your sins and mine. But as a result of that, uh, that blood that flowed is a cleansing blood, a renewing blood, a blood that makes us whole, the blood of the lamb. And he died, but yet he rose again. And so that there's power in the blood of the lamb. And there's power even in the name of Jesus Christ. And so there's power to live the life that God has called you to live. And so you need not say, I, it's too much for me. Yeah, we know it's too much for us. But God has enabled us uh, through the blood of the Lamb and through what he has provided, but also, also through the power of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And so we learn that. And so now uh, we're going to lift up some lessons that I want you uh, to internalize for your own spiritual life and journey that come from 1 John the first chapter, verse 8, through the second chapter, verse 2. And um, here we, we find, first of all, the, the prevalence of sin. And it was so important as the elder John, the beloved disciple, was writing this letter to a church that was in division and crisis and conflict because there was an influx of false teachers. There were ideologies of every kind you can imagine that were going on in the context in which they were growing as Christians. There are people who are bombarding the church with their ideas, additions to the gospel story. And there are people also who were influenced by Greek philosophy and uh, the Hellenistic in environment and society around to, to put a lot of stress on knowledge. And so the Gnostics uh, believe that the more knowledgeable you were, well, then the more spiritual you became. And as a result, they stress knowledge, but then they created kind of a spiritual elitism. So there are some people who thought they were better than other Christians in the life of the church because they knew more, they understood more, or they could articulate what they did understand in a better way. And so as a result, these people came into the church and there were great divisions. It appears from the writing and the background of this passage that there are certain people who left the church as a result of these conflicts and some of the false teachers took people off and then some people had come back and after they had got washed up in these these uh, aberrations of of the gospel message and so they decided then you know to come back and so John at this stage in his elder life and experience uh, simply wanted to bring the church together around the reality of who Jesus Christ is and the fact that he was human, but he also was divine. Because some of the Gnostics believed that human nature was so evil that then there's no way that Christ could have been human, that he had to be some kind of spirit or whatever. 
uh, but he, he couldn't be human because human nature is so bad. And as a result, they added to that that the body was so bad. So whatever the body wanted to do, it was allowed to do with all of its lusts and passions. And so they ignored anything like sin in their own lives. And they downplayed that because they had this spiritual knowledge. And they became better than other Christians in their own minds. And even thought that they could be perfect uh, because of rationality about God. But then uh, John understood that they distorted the true message of the gospel. And so he writes from a pastor's heart, actually. It's like uh, it, it's a correction letter, but it's also a pastoral letter uh, in order to set the record straight, yes, but also to love on the people of God in such a way that they not get off track with the authentic gospel message and what it means. And we've already seen that in the first few verses of the first chapter. But here then he attacks something that is so vital because there are those in the midst who then claim to be without sin because they could understand the gospel or they could articulate the gospel in certain dogmatic ways. And so therefore they then were able to rise above the rank and file of the other disciples and they thought they were better. And, you know, we have people in our world as well who think because they've memorized so many scriptures or they've never missed church or they're always attending this or that or the other or they do things that they think are Christian that as a result, they're better than other Christians. But while the world has a class system, the Bible doesn't and the spiritual family that we're a part of does not. We are all on the same level. And there's no high and mighty Christians, no supersized Christians according to the word. Now, that may be in your mind that you're better than someone else or, you know, somebody who's really a Christian and the others aren't. But we're only Christians because of the blood of the Lamb. And all of us have that in common. And Jesus died for all of us and not just a few of us. And so we all have access to the same level of acceptance through what God has done in Jesus Christ. So there's no room for being a perfect Christian and there's no room for judging others to be less than you. And there's no place for a church that believes we're the perfect church in the city because there simply are none. We're all at the same level. But what he says here, he says, if we can claim that we're without sin, well, then we deceive ourselves and we're not really living in the truth. You know, that means we're not telling the truth, but we're not really living in God's truth about us. Because the word of God says for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And so that means you, me, everybody, we're all in the same shape and we all need the same savior and we all need help to please God and to be what God has called us to be. But one thing that is really asserted here is that is that sin is prevalent in human nature and that's simply the reality. And so once we acknowledge that, well, then we're on our way then. Uh, to become intimate with God in a way that really blesses us in a mighty way. Uh, it's okay to say I'm wrong. It's all right to say I'm sorry. It's all right to say I missed a mark. Uh, I failed. I didn't do that right. It's all right to acknowledge that you're not perfect because you're not anyway, whether you acknowledge it or not. And so it's okay. And the beauty of this pastoral emphasis and letter is, is the fact of uh, you are accepted by God, but also you loved by God in a way that you can hardly understand. And so the second thing we understand is that there is a possibility of deception. Now, there is the possibility that when you begin to think you're perfect and without sin, and your sin is different than other people's sin, you begin to live in a way of deceiving yourself and deceiving others that really isn't healthy for you or for me. And, and so the beauty of reckoning with our condition is the fact that then we grow in faith, we become healthy, we become whole human beings, and we understand the true story, and so we live in the truth in a powerful way. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to acknowledge that you're a, a Christian, but you've sinned, because this next verse then gives us the grace that we really need. There's a possibility that you can live your whole life in deception about who you are, where you came from, and where you're going. But that's not living in the light, nor is it living in the truth. But we're called to live in both as we embrace who Jesus Christ is. And you have an opportunity. Look at that ninth verse. It's one, of, one verse that we urge all Christians to memorize. 
so that it can balance your life and deal with false guilt and remind you of the depth of God's love for you. It says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful, and God is just, and God will forgive our sins. But not only that, God also purifies us. What, what a marvelous weight is lifted off your shoulders when you are able to then realize that you are accepted in a way by God that nobody else can really fully accept you. And so confession then uh, is so important. There's the power of the truth in this passage that we emphasize, the truth about the world we live in, the truth about ourselves, the truth about God's word, and the truth about what God wants for us and how we measure up and how we don't. But then there's also uh, the priority of confession, uh, the need to confess our sins. And, and you know how important it is even in relationships that you're involved in uh, when you're really dealing with issues that might separate you or cause conflict, how important it is to have a, a significant confrontational, <laughs> authentic conversation about what has happened, about your part in it, about what you need to do about it. And good parents teach their children that. They don't just discipline them and say you did something wrong, but they find ways to talk it out and to help children understand why that was wrong and to help them to know that mommy, daddy still loves you, but it's important for you to say what you did because we already know what you did, but we want you to reckon with it. And so if you confess it, then our relationship will be better but what is of utmost importance is that your heart will be better because you've learned the importance of telling the truth, but also confessing when you were wrong and know that you're still part of this family, you're still very much loved, and I love you even more because you're willing to even acknowledge what you've done. Well, those are good parents, and those are spiritual parents, and those are parents that are on the right track, and they raise healthy, whole people, young people and children, who then can impact the world and help other people. And so it says if we confess our sins, that is a priority. And if we simply agree with God, our condition, well, then that's not the end of the story because God forgives us. And in that forgiveness, there's a second chance. There's a new beginning because the God we serve is a God of pardon. And so we recognize the pardon of God and what that really means for us. You know, someone said that confession not denial of sin, but confession is a hallmark of the genuine believer's heart. And I certainly believe that as well, because it's based on the fact that God is not only faithful, but God is credible and God is dependable and God will come through for us and the Lord will be there. And to experience the pardon of God just means that God then releases your offense. Have you ever thought about the fact that your life can be offensive to God? <laughs> that God can be offended by the way you live in your life. And then to know that you're released from that offense, that it comes to an end, that, that the individual's offense is over when God's pardon comes into your life. And what a marvelous ministry that is to us, that you are pardoned by God. It's like you're under a sentence and you are set free, that now you are free. And Paul talks about it in Rome as being justified by faith, that we are justified by faith. Uh, we haven't earned what God has given to us, but God has given freely by his grace, and his grace will see us through. And what a marvelous reality that really is for us. But anybody who says that they have not sinned really is about uh, a perversion of the gospel, um, a distortion of the reality of what God has said. And there are people in this particular fellowship and around this fellowship that really believed that for some reason, that they were above sin and they did not sin. Others did, but they didn't because they were so spiritual. And so then the apostle and this beloved disciple, this pastor then attacks that in order to set somebody free. Because what is promised here is the purity that comes from grace. And it's not from good works. It's not from trying hard. It's not from any of that. But it's by the grace of God. And that amazing grace, you know, it's sung in our hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. 
Well, well, the purity comes out of the grace of God in our life, in your life and mine. And so the, the verse says, let's go back to 9 and then read through 10. Uh, follow along with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that represents transformation, change. We can get better. You can do better. I can do better. But it says in verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Well, who in the world would want to call God a liar? Uh, I don't know, but we don't want to do that. And so as a result, let's just accept what the Lord has said about us, that we need help. We need to be forgiven. We need the restoration. We need change in our hearts and in our lives. And so we don't want to be part of any group who then calls God a liar, but rather we want to embrace the full promise of God. And let's look at that in the next verse. And then he says, my dear children, the term of endearment, indicating a close relationship that he had with the people of faith there. Isn't that beautiful? My dear children. It's out of love that those words are uttered. It's not out of judgment. It's not out of any kind of dogmatic uh, sense of arrival of another person. It's not him talking down to them, but it's really saying, you know, I love you, my dear children. And he's a senior person, so he can say that. And he's in a pastoral role, so he can say that. And he is a authentic apostle, so he can say it that way. And he says, my dear children, I, I write this to you so that you will not sin. So I don't want, he, in other words, he said, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm giving you a license to sin because God's love is so gracious and God will forgive your sin. So then you begin to com learn to be comfortable with sin and say, sin is no big deal because I'm going to be forgiven anyway. Well, no, that that's not what he's saying. What he's saying it is that there is the possibility of you to live in a way that pleases God ultimately because that way has been made by the blood of the Lamb by the cross and the resurrection. And as a result of that, there is the possibility with God's help that you can live like that. So don't get uh, cozy with sin as if it's okay and it's your friend, but rather understand that you have someone working on your behalf who is getting it right for you in your life. He says, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And who is that advocate? Well, it's Jesus Christ. And it's really interesting that unlike any other place in the word, that this word advocate really is the same word that's used for paraclete in the gospel of John, where it really refers to the Holy Spirit. And in that definition of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a comforter, but also the Holy Spirit is a counselor and the Holy Spirit is a helper. So really it's saying your ultimate help then comes from Jesus Christ. He stands between you and your sin. He, he stands in the midst of your brokenness and mine. But he is the redeemer. He is the healer. He is the savior. He is the righteous one. He is the means out and through and over. And that's where we get our victory. And so in verse 2 then it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so you see God's love for everybody there reflected, but also the ministry of Christ is not just for your church and not just for you and your friends, but also is for every body in the world. It's for the whole earth. It's for everyone. And that atonement, which you can break up into at one moment, which means that there's no conflict any longer between you and God. You're not fighting with God any longer. <clears throat> now you're surrendering to the will and the purpose of God for your life. It's atonement, at one moment. So now it's a life of peace. I'm at peace with God. And if you're at peace with God, it means that you can be at peace with yourself. And if you're at peace with yourself, you can be at peace with other people, in the, even in the midst of conflict. You don't have to let the conflict then, then overwhelm who you truly are and your identity with Christ or being the good person that you want to be. And once we understand that, well, then the help is available and God is there to see us through and to partner with us in the midst of that. And we know that we have the promise of God. And turn with me as we quickly come to a close. <clears throat> I'd like for us to read together the first part of uh, Paul's utterance of the same state and reality that we are in in his letter to the Roman Christians. That would be the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. 
you know, one of the favorite chapters of so many people, and maybe it will be yours, and it's an opportunity to read that chapter even again. But he says here, there, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Hallelujah. We're set free. We're not condemned. God came to love us, not to condemn us. He came to save us. And if you don't have that kind of reassurance in your life, we just want to take a moment to invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe a lot of this that was said maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. But one thing that we want you to hear is that God so loved the world, that means you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him, in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And everlasting life is not just living forever, but it's living with a quality of life where you get peace and forgiveness, you get mercy and love, you get joy and fulfillment, and the list goes on and on. But, but it starts with you opening your heart to the Lord and saying in your inner, inner being, yes, I want God in my life and I want to learn who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for me. And I'm willing to confess that I am a sinner, that I do need help right now. And I need someone to come into this mess I'm in. I need someone to come into this heart of mine. I need somebody to come into this house of mine. I need somebody to come into this marriage of mine. I need someone to come into my life and to make a difference and to do something. I tried, but I couldn't do it. And now I confess, I need Christ. Lord, come into my life. Be my Savior. And, you know, that happens through a, a different a, 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 a means than just attending a public meeting. And we all want to attend church and be in a fellowship and particularly powerful worship experiences. There's nothing like them. But, but, you know, you can do that right where you are now. You don't need a pastor or preacher to do that. All you need to do is, is just bow your head or get on your knees or open your mouth and say, Lord, I need your help right now. Please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Lead me and guide me and show me how to get through all of this. I give my heart to you. And when you do that, things begin to happen in your life. And in the New Testament, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know what that means? That means change. It means difference. And it gets, it gets us back to that question uh, that all of us need to answer. And when you give your heart to Jesus, you can answer it too. And that question is, what difference has Jesus Christ made in your life? I want you to ponder that. What difference has Jesus Christ made in your life, my friend? Well, he has made a big difference in mine, and he's still making a difference. And so we bless you in the name of the Lord. You may follow us through our Facebook. You may follow us through YouTube and through our website, First Baptist Church, 101 South Wilmington Street uh, in North Carolina in the great city of Raleigh, and we invite you to come, and we ask you to pray for us and to remember us in prayer. And if the Lord leads you, you may send offerings to us that we might continue this ministry and that we might continue as a church. We're not worshiping anymore every Sunday right now, and we need, we need tithes and offerings, and we need help uh, to continue on the ministry that we are doing here. And we anticipate a great getting up morning when we come back together to the church. It's going to be wonderful. We want you to be here with us. We want you to join us whenever that is. We'll send the word out to you. And we all will be happy to be free from staying home. And the first place we ought to find ourselves going is church. It is the worship. Finding the Lord. Will you pray with me now? Let us bow in a moment of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you and <clears throat> we praise you for your word that is so liberating, so encouraging, so redemptive. And we thank you, Lord, that we have a savior, an advocate, even a paraclete, even a counselor, a helper. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, forgive us of our sins of thought, word, and deed. Forgive us of our sins of omission or commission. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Let us receive your forgiving love. I receive your forgiving love. And we pray for those who are hearing your word and need that personal relationship with you. Touch their hearts in a mighty way that new life can begin for them, that they can become all that you want for them to become. We pray for the many who are mourning in homes across the globe. We pray for children's families who are mourning their loss. We pray for the tragedies that we are hearing about day after day. And we pray especially for those who are right there risking their lives, helping others. Bless them, strengthen them, protect them is our prayer, O oh Lord. Now just be with those who are carrying a burden and the load in these moments, are caring for children and loved ones, their caretakers who need your help. Lord, be with them in a mighty, mighty way. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are unemployed those who are not receiving the funds they used to to take care of their own families and obligations and people now who are struggling for food we pray for the homeless population <clears throat> and we pray for those in our in our prisons lord that you would touch them in a mighty way we pray for those who are leaders across the states and leaders in our nation who are making decisions bless them lord give them wisdom give them unity Unify America is our prayer, O oh Lord. Anoint and bless the doctors and nurses and support staff that are helping so many people. And be with the chaplains who are standing at bedsides in some cases. Be with pastors and leaders spiritually across our land. Just be with us, Lord, in a mighty way. Protect the children, protect the marriages, and protect your body. That is your church and for all that you have done, and for what you're doing now, and for what you will do in days ahead, we give your name praise. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, amen. God bless you.